was interesting. The learning was interesting. He learned how to take care of a horse, how to feed a horse, how to polish its skin, how to make friends with it. The he got the money, went to the farmer, got the cotton and went to the spinner. He looked at her wide-eyed as she took the raw cotton and spun it into yarn. Can you teach me? He said. Of course, but you'll have to pay me. Of course. So he sat down and learned how to spin the yarn, took the thread, went up to the carpet weaver. By this time, his thirst for learning had increased. He went up to the carpet weaver and asked him, can you help me to make this carpet myself? Sure. And so he sat down with the carpet weaver and made a beautiful carpet. He took it to his teacher and gave it to him. This time, he bent down and asked the teacher, Sir, can you please help me with some knowledge? The teacher laughed and said, Knowledge? My dear boy, you already have so much of it. What do you mean? Well, you learned how to take care of a horse. You learned that it is important to be kind to animals. You learned how hard the farmer works. You learn how to spin. You learn how to weave a carpet. If that is not knowledge, then what is? So that is a Sufi tale, which I like to call the carpet of knowledge. Now, am I telling this story to you today? Um, anyone has any thoughts on that? Please put it out into the chat. What do you think is the relevance of your story today? Um, yeah, sorry, I didn't see the message. Uh, you had asked me to pause for a minute. No, ma'am, it's done. Oh, okay, no problem. Okay, yeah. So what is the, what is the connection between uh, experiential learning and the story? Anyone? Okay, learn from experience, absolutely. Anything else? Okay, knowledge cannot be bought. Yes, it comes through experience. And yet we all go through our entire school system hoping that 10 years of paying the fees will give us knowledge, right? We still do it even today. So, uh, yes, learning from experience, absolutely. Sharing our knowledge and experiences, absolutely, absolutely, yes. So I think experiential learning was always there. It was, it's not really a new concept, except that now the entire concept has been put forward in a very structured way, right? Most of our earlier schools, most of the learning we did the learning we did at home, the learning we did outside, uh, the learning, for example, that we, uh, as we played with our friends, we realized that, you know, we are not the boss and whatever we say will not happen. And probably one day we got even roughed up and we lost and we cried and we learned to be together and be with people. We learned teamwork. That is experiential learning for you. How much more effective it is than telling children how important teamwork is. What are the benefits of teamwork? Yes, absolutely. We realize, we realize what we learn while we do. That is such an interesting point. So now I would like, like you, I would like to take you through with my thoughts on this topic that is experiential learning. Experiential learning is immersive. It's not, it's not one dimensional. It's not something which is you hear. It's not something which you only see. It's there all around you. Just like the story, the story, the carpet of knowledge, the boy immersed himself in the learning. So it is not something that he's easily going to forget, right? So based on that story, here are some of 
what I would say are the advantages or the benefits of experiential learning. Yeah, so um, retention. Yes, absolutely. So uh, can can uh, can you all put in your thoughts on all this? Uh, rather than me telling, can you all put down your thoughts on uh, what these imply, right? Retention. How does experiential learning uh, aid retention? Retention is it allows you to retain uh, things in your memory better. Retention and as a result of it, recall. Right? Anyone has anything to say? Or any of these? Retention, connection, engagement, emotions, and application. So how do you retain information? How do we retain information? How does our brain retain information? Through the connections that are developed. Right? So I know this is a water bottle. I know this has water. And I know how this water tastes. I also know that I should not use plastic water bottles. Now, this much information, they're all not got at the same period of time. Yeah. So, exactly. Memories with emotion attached to it. Right? Memories. So, your experiential learning, when you immerse your children in experiential learning, they're not just seeing. They're not just hearing, they are experiencing it in the sense that along with the emotions, they are touching, they are feeling, they are interacting. So it's not one memory that comes in, it's a hundreds of memories of each single activity they do. Now, when the number of memories are so high and so connected, then the chance that they will remember and recall just multiplies. <clears throat> as compared to a didactic classroom. Now, what if, of course, that is about retention, connection. Yes, through practical experiences, definitely students can learn fast because of the number of memory connections, right? And the connection is the connection to what they are learning, right? I am learning today. I am talking to you about uh, immersive learning, experiential learning. Now, why does it matter? Why does it matter, right? Now, you will be able to appreciate it. You'll be able to connect to that point. If you are, if I put you in a situation where you experience its benefit, right? Rather than me telling that this is how it is. So you are able to, and you are able to connect it to your everyday events. You see how it works. You see how it doesn't work. You know where it can be applied. So this spells with any kind of education. This is not very specific to STEM. I would say with any kind of subject, with anything, right? So this helps to bridge a connection with the outside world. And of course, you will all agree that experiential learning engages the child in a way traditional learning will really fail to um, engage emotions. I heard someone talk about it. Yes, emotional learning gives a different dimension to the learning. When you learn something with emotions, you retain it because human beings are emotional animals. We tend to attach emotions to a lot of things. And those emotions, the happiness of having cracked it, or even the sadness of not having been able to do it, the fun you had as you were doing it, the anticipation, the expectation, all this go into the experiential learning. It is not just doing an experiment, right? If Let's say we go to a class and it's a science class. The science teacher is doing an experiment. All the teachers are watching. All the teachers, I mean, all the students are watching. Would you call it experiential learning? What do you say? Any of you? No? Yeah, absolutely not. So why not? What is missing there?
what is missing there? What is missing in that particular scenario? The teacher per conducts an experiment. So, okay, my question uh, is that, let us say you are, uh, I mean, it's a science class. Teacher is conducting an experiment uh, perfectly. Yes, see, right? So the teacher is conducting, all the students are crowding around it and watching it. They see it happening. Would you call it experiential learning was my question. No, was the answer I'm asking. Why? Okay, yeah. Students are not experiencing it. Yes. And teachers are only performing. Okay. Okay. It is only observation. Okay. Very nice. Now with that, let us go on to what is required. Uh, what exactly uh, you need to do uh, in to create an environment for experiential learning. So the experiential learning uh, is looked at as four stages where the experiencing, uh, reflecting, thinking, and acting. There are many, you can find many other terms and terminologies, but they are all pretty much the same. They're pretty much the same. So as you see, there's an outer circle there. So what this I'm trying to tell you is as a teacher, how can you create an experiential learning um, activity or an environment in your classroom? So the first step is always to activate interest, just like in any other form of learning. The first step is always to catch their interest, put a hook and get them. Even in experiential learning, this is required. Now, just because you say that I'm going to let you do something, I'm going to let you uh, get yourself immersed in it, it doesn't mean that you have to, you can do away with that, with this particular stage. For the children, it is still learning. It is still an activity. So an initial activity, yes, yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, students should try their hands on different experiments and reflect the learning experience. Yes. Absolutely. That, would, that is what would become experiential learning. But experiments are not the only thing that you can look at as experiential learning. So that is what I, uh, I have here, the slide, uh, where I'm trying to tell you, let us say you have a classroom. What are the different things you need to do to create an experiential learning environment? The first step, as I was telling, is always to activate the interest. What is the activity? Why should it matter to them? What is the space they are in currently? How to get them away from that space? They may have finished their PT period. They may be, it may be, they may have come back after lunch. They may have had a hard uh, last period where they did a lot of problems and their not mind is not yet there. They are not, you have a beautiful session planned and it's going to be so much fun, but the children are not yet primed for the fun. So just because the session itself is going to be fun, you cannot do away with this. So you need to have some kind of an activity where you activate interest in the activity that you're going to perform. Then secondly, you need to create a learning space. Now, the difference between creating the learning structure and learning space is that when you create a learning space, you give freedom to the child. You give them the space. You set all the things that they need to do. You look, you, you know, in different corners or probably in centralized, you keep the things that will be useful for them. You put charts, you put labels. You can even tell what they are, but you are not going to tell them completely what to do. That will be the true experiential learning. So I asked a question before, let's say the teacher does the experiment and the students are observing. Many of you said, no, it's not experiential learning. Some of you said that it's partial. Now let's say I take it a step further and the teacher explains the experiment to the child and all the children do it independently. Is this experiential learning? What do you think? Yes. Okay. Yes. Any? 
Any other answers? Anyone else has any difference of opinion? Teachers, please put in your thoughts into the chat and uh, it would be great. And the session would be much more experiential if you all participate. So thank you. Please put in your thoughts. Okay, partial. Okay, Kadabri ma'am says partial again. So let's ask Kadabri ma'am, can you uh, tell us in some aspects, can you elaborate on that? Why is it not it's still 100% there? Please, uh, please let me know your thoughts. Why do you think I do agree with you that it's really not complete experiential learning? It's very, very, very partial in the sense that just starting to get into that domain. Why would you say that? Okay. So um, if they put their own inputs, then it becomes experiential learning. If only the basic knowledge is given by the teachers, the, uh, the students are explaining their ideas. Okay. Um, yeah, that is pretty much, I would agree with that. But I'm also wondering, what do you mean by the students are explaining their ideas? Yeah. Children have to observe and conclude from their experiments, agree. But that is part of the procedure that has been given to them. The teacher tells them, measure this much, take this much, measure this much, mix this and this, and then write down your observations. How much of the uh, you know chemical did you have to miss in or mix in order to reach this point? But is that experiential? The children are performing. Each child is taking a pipette, a burette and a test tube, and then he's putting it over the, uh, what is it, Bunsen burner, dum, 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 they're doing that. And then they're getting a result and they're recording. Is it experiential? Okay, freedom of decision making. Very interesting, very interesting. Yes, absolutely. That is a very, very major point. Now, uh, why that is definitely not experiential learning is, they are just repeating. Agreed. They are touching and feeling. They feel the uh, feel the pipette. They feel the burette. They feel the test tube. They uh, putting it onto that. All that is fine. But what are they learning? They're just following. They are following what the teacher told them. That is also not experiential learning. When it becomes experiential learning is when you tell them, this is what you're trying to do. Now, these are the things that are used for these different purposes. Let's say, uh, this is the pipette is used if you want to take this kind of measurements. If you want to take, you know, a larger number of measurements, you can use this. This is a glass beaker. Why do you think this glass beaker is here and not a steel vessel? Do you think you can use a steel vessel here? Do you think you can use a plastic? Why not? Why do people in labs, in chemical labs, use borosilicate glass? What is the purpose? Okay, let's discuss that. Now, why do you think, why do you think it is important for us to take measurements like this? Why can't we just mix it like we mix coffee and tea? What does it matter? Okay, let's discuss that also. Now that you have understood that precise measurements are important, and this is why we have the different lab equipment, let me tell you why at all we are trying to do this. What is the salt analysis? Why is it important in your life or in your profession, in a lab? Why would people do this? What, what do people do in a chemistry lab? Okay, now that you know what you're trying to do, Shall we now try to do the experiment? What I am trying to achieve is that I want to mix these two and then identify the salt. Now, remember, there are some safety rules. Why do we need safety rules? Yeah, why do we need safety rules? Why is it important to, why is it important to have safety rules in a chemistry lab? It's not that the teacher says, don't touch, leave it there. If it breaks, you'll have to pay. It's not the point. The point is the children should think about the safety rules. Now they, th they thought about the safety rules. They thought about the purpose. 
they thought about why certain equipment are used they thought about why this entire uh, experiment needs to be done they learned about the different things in the lab now they are ready to experiment right the truth is we take the word experiment and make a joke out of it in our school system we think that an experiment is something that is performed no an experiment is something where the child has an option to understand that this can go either way experiment is something that they have to pin right yeah so that is why as a teacher you create a safe space for the learning that doesn't mean you say okay guys all of you get in now this is a chemistry lab you do whatever you want let me go and sit there when you need me you call me that won't work you are the teacher you know better than them this is the truth you know what some of the things which should not be done you know some of the things which can be done but allow them to explore it and along with teaching what to do also teach them how to do that okay now instead of writing on the board and saying that okay once you get all the results put a table like this in your notebook 1 2 3 4 4 trials trial 1 what is the value trial 2 what is the value trial 3 what is the value trial 4 what is the value done that is the experimenting why are they having four trials who told them einstein definitely not who is the authority who says that you have to have four trials why should we put it in a table like this why do we even have to have more than one trial let them experiment and find out i will take this particular point right so why should we have multiple trials now you want the children to learn that in an experiential way how will you do it so i'll repeat my question again so this is i since i started with a chemistry lab i am retaining myself in the chemistry lab it's not that this is applicable applicable only to chemistry so we are in a chemistry lab and uh, we have a certain experiment and our we know our procedure requires that every child needs to do it four times you know why we should do it four times the child doesn't know in an experiential way how will you help them understand why it is important to do it four times any thoughts please flood the flood the chat with your thoughts and anyone okay so let me um yeah okay so uh for accuracy absolutely you know that it is for accuracy but how will you help them understand in an experiential way without telling them that you need to do four trials for accuracy okay for example you ask all of them to do one trial write down all their readings on the board now they use the same quantity right they you all you all of them they let's say there are 30 students in your class you will get 30 different values now how do we do an experiment with 30 different values what does it mean how do we how can we uh, you know make sure that this is more um Um, accurate so then the answer will come from then that if i repeat it once again what will happen shall i try repeating it once again then they can try repeating it once again then they will know that they don't match so then you know that oh that is why i need to do four trials now this is a learning that they will carry through their life that you cannot take anything at face value the first time it doesn't matter if it is 
precision of values in a chemistry lab or an opinion you build on your friend. Accuracy cannot come in one trial. Now, you may be doing something in a chemistry lab, but you have actually helped them to understand a lesson because they have seen it. They have understood that accuracy cannot come with one trial. So that is why it is very important to create the learning space and scaffold the learning. You have to give them some inputs. Now comes um, one minute. I, I will, I'll come up for your questions in a minute, but let me just finish this. Now the third most, the next most important part, I would say more important than all of this is reflection. That is also something that we often miss. We do a great activity, fun, 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 fun. It's completely gamified. Children are running all over the place. They didn't even know that they learned. It's completely experiential. And then they come and hug you and say, you're the best teacher. This has been so great. I loved this class. Please come to our class every time, ma'am. And you are also on top of the world. See how interesting you made for them. But what was it that got missed out? Anyone? If you stop at that stage, what is it that gets missed out? Reflection. After every learning, let alone experiential, any other kind of learning, they need to reflect. Here especially it's important because they are going through the process of learning, right? So they need to reflect. They need, they need more than the learning outcomes. Yes, the learning outcomes for themselves. That's correct. So what is the learning outcome for themselves? It is okay that your learning outcome is different from mine. Right? It is okay. It is fine. It's not always possible that all of us come to the same conclusion unless it is rigged. Right? So it's okay. So each of them, you have to give them space and time to reflect on their own learning. What was the outcome of it? And the outcome is definitely not a value. Yes, it is confidence. It is what they have achieved that day. The confidence that comes out of doing something themselves, right? It's not about uh, older kids. This is very true for such even preschoolers. The happiness that they get out of finding out. Why do kids love detective books? Right, you know, after the time there are four, five, they love all these whodunits, any Blyton. Why was any Blyton so popular? She allowed them to investigate. She allowed them to reflect. Right? So you, by allowing the children to investigate and then reflect, you complete the circle. Except for the last one, which is Guided self-exploration. You need to tell them that this is what we learned today. How do you connect it to your daily life? Where have you seen this happen? And it is not, again, just the experiment. It is not the focus of your study. Where have you seen this thing about accuracy? Where have you seen this about breakable material? How many times do we talk to children about the importance of why lab safety is important? What is that that goes behind it? Right? All their learning outcomes, how can they apply to their life? So this entire circle together will complete your experiential learning lesson in your classroom. It is not just the act. Activity. The activity is the first and the most, one of the important points, I won't say most important, but reflection and connection are equally important to any kind of experiential learning. Yes. So uh, I will uh, pause now and uh, if you have any questions. Sorry. I'm just looking through my chat.
Yes, absolutely. Okay, I see here someone uh, saying brief for preschool kids also. Uh, absolutely. So uh, as I said, I picked up an example of a chemi chemistry experiment because that at that point of time, it came to my mind. It is absolutely true even for preschoolers. Let us say um, phonics. You're trying to teach them about phonics. You have uh, the sounds, you have the sound chart, and you do that action, all that you do, and you ask them to do it. Again, it doesn't become experiential. How can you make phonics learning experiential? Anyone, any thoughts, any ideas, please put it up. Just by telling them, by having a chart, pointing it out to them, or even having a video with a monkey dancing doesn't make it experiential. What could make phonics learning experiential? Anyone? How can you help them understand that these different sounds are made by different meta, uh, letters? Okay, we utter the words first. We ask the children what sound is coming. Okay. Action, you add actions to it. Maybe you can create a game where based on, uh, uh, you know, a particular sound or a particular uh, sound and a particular combination, phonetic combination, they have to do a certain action, right? It's a simple way of gamifying a, a phonics activity, right? Or maybe you can ask them to go around the classroom, naming everything and splitting it up. or you can ask them to take each and every name of each and every person and trying to uh, uh, try to split it up phonetically, trying to find the letter sound. How many of you have the at sound in your names? Right? So what are they doing? They are exploring. They are going from here to there, here to there, trying to understand. Yes. Um, I see a question here. Uh, what is the role of technology integration and in experiential learning? Um, I think maybe I can uh, answer that uh, with my next slide, but any other questions? Yeah? Okay. Okay. So now we are looking at different ways of putting it into a lesson plan, right? So uh, again, this is a um, this is a short list. I won't say it's a long list. It's a short list. It's not a short list. It's not a long list because there are many, many, many other ways which you can explore, okay? Field visits. Field visits are uh, an absolute common way to uh, provide children experiential learning. You too may be taking out your children on field visits, taking them out to different places. But what is very often missed out with the field visits is the reflection part. So usually the teacher may summarize. That's not what needs to be done. The children need to have a full period after a field visit where they talk about their experiences. They talk about what they learn. They share with each other and then they cement it. And then they talk about their experiences of similar places, of similar situations, right? So field visits are definitely uh, a, a very interesting way of uh, creating an experiential learning lesson plan. Social immersion, again, uh, I'm sure many of you in your schools will be doing it. Um, Take them to a situation where they'll be able to build a social connect with people. This could be, uh, you know, to places where they meet people who need their help, 
they meet people where they can give their help it could be you know calling someone uh, to your class uh, and you know someone who is very different from them and have them interacting with that person understand that person immerse with that person in conversation and then learn rather than saying for example let us say i want to teach my children that they should be kind to differently abled people now one way is of course to tell tell them that's the first easy way to tell them that they are all so uh, we are all the same and then you know um if you meet people who are making fun of them or you should you need to stop them that is the first thing which we tell on the other hand like someone was asking about technology integration even if you cannot get them to your school can you arrange a video conference with someone let them talk let them share their experiences let them talk about what what was their driving factors what helped them succeed let the children ask questions that becomes immersive guide them guide them with their questions and always reflect later as to what they learned experiments we already spoke about it role plays and mock ups are another very uh, uh, critical way i would say of experiential learning so um, uh, for example for uh, when you are looking at concepts uh, it could be in science it could be in social studies english i mean uh, languages anything it role play need not be restricted to literature you can do a role play on bacteria right you can do a role play on freedom fighters you can do a role play on what it is not to be free right you can do a role play on um, a math problem i know uh, what do you say statement problems are many children's nightmare can you do a role play on that ask them to actually uh, do uh, work it out there and you know then they will come up with uh, you know with so many other conditions and they'll probably have you uh, completely stumped you'll say oh, i don't know how to solve this problem this is much more complicated because they'll be applying their real life to it right so role plays and mock ups are a beautiful way to bring in experiential learning classroom games uh, again hot favorite children will love it but always make sure that you don't miss out on the reflection part of it internships for older kids and storytelling if you cannot do any of these if there is a situation where uh, you will not be able to immerse them in that way one of the easiest way to immerse uh, our children give them an experiential experience is through stories when we share stories we don't just tell facts we create that atmosphere they say with stories you take them across the river right to where the place is you're not standing on this side and talking about the river on the other side you're not talking about the bank on the other side we take them there right so storytelling is again a beautiful way for them to experience some things which may not be possible otherwise and of course technology with ai um, and uh, vr ar all these if you have access to that if you are able to take them to museums they will also provide a very immersive experience for the children which is away from books which is away from pictures now pictures have become static like powerpoint presentation is not immersive powerpoint presentation is not experiential it's just a picture what you do with that powerpoint can become experiential okay um so i think that was what we have time for any questions um from anyone yeah uh, math we do math problems with materials yes that is correct but also um uh, are you driving the problem or are they driving the problem that is something that you can make it experiential let us say that uh, instead of saying that okay uh, uh, i want to do something about uh, profit and loss uh, uh, something like that i'm talking about i want to calculate profit instead of saying that okay so now this is this this is this this is this uh, now this is the way to calculate profit why don't you come and do it here instead of even doing that can you tell them that okay now let's set up a store 
why don't you set up something you are going to sell? Right? So now there is a buyer who comes there. Now, uh, you have to put down how much you're going to spend for what you have. Let the buyer come there. What is he willing to pay? Now, do you get a profit or do you get a loss? Are you happy with it or not? Do you think you could have got a better profit if you had quoted a higher price? What stopped you from quoting a higher price? So the entire experience, and they will never forget profit and loss. They will actually have done it. Yeah. So, um, any questions? Okay. Um, I don't see any questions. Any anything anything there uh, that I need to answer? Yeah, teaching in the form of a story can make it extremely experiential and you can make it very interactive. So because uh, you are not using the story here for storytelling, you're using it for teaching. When you use a story for teaching, the way you tell itself will become very different. Uh, <clears throat> so you can make it very interactive. You can involve the children in, into the story. And as they, uh, you know, as they fall into the story literally, uh, it's no longer separate from reality. They are in there. They are experiencing it. Isn't that why sometimes you cry when you watch something on TV or you laugh? You're there, right? You're there with those people. That's why you're laughing. You're finding what they're saying funny, right? So an immersive experience makes it for, makes for experiential learning. Thank you. Yes, absolutely, yes. Yes, yes, children can create their own word problems and present and role play. It would be so awesome. And they will have ownership on it, right? So, and they will make mistakes. So that is one thing that, you know, it's very important in experiential learning. So I think I had a slide on, right? Create a safe space. Lack of judgment is very important. If you are going to start judging, you, at the first step, you know it is right. See. There are some subjects where there can be multiple answers. In mathematics, there can be only a single answer most of the time. Yet, allow them to make mistakes. There is no need to jump in and say that that was wrong. Allow them to make mistakes. Ask them to review the procedure. What went wrong? Of course, one thing I will agree is that this method of teaching definitely requires more bandwidth, more time, more creativity. but I believe it is really worth it as I have been using it a lot. I conduct a lot of uh, programs and sessions with children uh, and I always try to make it as experiential as possible. Yes, that's great. Yes, ma'am, absolutely. Let them figure out their mistakes. It's, you know, like an, it's like a detective work. I have made a mistake. Now, it's fun for me to find out what mistake I have made. Can you make it fun for them and not a uh, um, shameful exercise? I made a mistake. I want to find out what it is. Let's find out. Let's say I, it's a simple thing. You ask for capitals. Uh, someone says the capital of uh, um, Karnataka is Chennai. It's a mistake. It's, you can say that's a mistake. You can say, oh, that's a mistake. I asked you to study yesterday. What happened? Or you can say, is that what you think? Why don't you open your atlas? Go to um, Karnataka and do find Chennai there. Chennai, 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 Chennai. Oh, Chennai. What is there? Can you see one uh, city that is slightly bigger, whose name is slightly bigger than the others? Why do you think that is so? Do you think that may be the capital city? Then there is experiential learning for you. The children find out themselves. So uh, I will stop here at that. So uh, if there are no more questions,
I think uh, I'm done with what I had to say. Thank you, thank you all. Yeah, um, Manoj, anything else? I'm, uh, as the American, I'm done. Thank you, thank you all. I'm really, really happy that I, uh, you all found it useful. Um, I always love to share my thoughts with teachers um, and, of course, listen to their thoughts. Thank you, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can Great. hear you. So thank you so much for uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, so yeah, I, I think due to the technical technical issue, uh, Isha got dropped out. So no worry. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for conducting such a great session. I can check the chat, and teachers are really praising your session. So thank you so much for your time energy. Mm -hmm. I know it's very difficult for you to get some time out of your busy schedule, but thank you so much for sharing your expertise with our teachers. Thank you. Thank you so much. I uh, I'm really happy. Uh, I, I, I'm not, and I'm not even saying this deeply from the tip of my tongue. I have a lot of respect for teachers and I know the amount of hard work that they put in. So, uh, as I said, anything that I can share, uh, which would be useful to you, uh, I'm very happy to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, teachers, I have just shared the feedback form in the chat. Please do fill up this feedback form and do let, uh, let us know your uh, thoughts about the session and what are you looking forward uh, in an upcoming session as well. Please do fill up this feedback form. Thank you. Thank you.